Tom. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Tom Padula for this uh, what is really a quite inspirational contribution to Australia Day celebrations and for giving me the opportunity to speak about Australia's literary icons. When I was asked by Tom to contribute something about Australia's literary icons, I naturally thought about Banjo Patterson, Henry Lawson, Patrick White, but I've chosen to focus on several different writers and I'll explain why I have chosen each of them. The notes I've given Tom refer to the cricket writer Gideon Hay, but because I don't really have time to give all four of my chosen icons the analysis they deserve, I'll be content with inviting you to read some of Gideon's fine writings for yourself and I will focus on the other three in more detail. Two are historians and one is a poet. My first literary icon is Manning Clark. Manning Clark is the best known historian of Australia. His sixth volume, A History of Australia, took 25 years to write, from 1962 to 1987. He covered Australian history from 1788, the arrival of the First Fleet, to the end of the Second World War in 1945. There is simply nothing else so broad in scope, so comprehensive in detail, so profoundly influential, written concerning Australian history. By the time Manning Clark died in 1991, he had become a national institution. His goatee beard, his bush hat, his stout walking stick, his enigmatic public utterances had become widely known, even among people who had never opened any of his books. He is not only Australia's best known historian, he is also its most controversial. The older he got, and particularly after his death, the more he was attacked by right-wing political commentators and the more he was defended by left-wing ones. This is somewhat ironic, given his heritage and his early career and writings. Manning Clark was born in Sydney in 1915, the son of an old Australian establishment family, his mother being a descendant of the Reverend Samuel Marsden. Clark won a scholarship to Trinity College at Melbourne University, gaining first-class honours in ancient history and British history, he captained the college cricket team. In 1940, he started teaching history at Geelong Grammar School and coached Geelong Grammar's first 11 cricket team, which was regarded as a very prestigious appointment. While at Geelong, he began to systematically read Australian history, literature and criticism for the first time. The result was his first publication on an Australian theme, an open letter to the 19th century Australian writer Tom Collins on the subject of mateship. In 1948, Manning Clark was promoted to senior lecturer at Melbourne University, but experienced the chill winds of McCarthyism. A Victorian Liberal MP claimed that there was communist infiltration of Melbourne University, naming two academics, one of them Jim Cairns. Manning Clark defended his colleagues on radio and was then attacked himself. 30 of his students signed a letter saying he was a learned and sincere teacher of irreproachable loyalty and the Melbourne University branch of the Communist Party said that Clark was a reactionary and no friend of theirs. <laughs> Nevertheless, Clark moved to Canberra and the Australian National University. In 1950, he published the first of two volumes of select documents in Australian history. During this period, Clark was regarded as a conservative both politically and in his approach to Australian history. He attacked many of the views of the old left nationalist historians, such as their romanticising of convicts and bushrangers and pioneers. He rejected the idea that the diggers of Eureka were revolutionaries. Uh, he concluded that they were aspiring cap capitalists, we might call them aspirationals now. He also concluded that the dominant creed of the 1890s was not socialism, but fear of Asian immigration. He argued that much of Australian history could be seen as a three-sided struggle between Catholicism, Protestantism and secularism. The dominant theme of the early volumes of his history was the interplay between the harsh environment of the Australian continent and the European values of the early settlers. He was chiefly interested in colourful in individuals like uh, William Bly or William Wentworth. He paid little attention to the 20th century preoccupation with economic and social history. Given the claims after his death that he was a closet communist, 
It's noteworthy that in 1971 he took part in a demonstration outside the Soviet Embassy in Can Canberra against the Soviet persecution of the author Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And in 1985 he again took part in an anti-Soviet demonstration in support of the Polish trade union Solidarity. Manning Clark became a great fan of Gough Whitlam and his final volume of Australian history drew a sharp contrast between Robert Menzies and wartime Labor Prime Minister John Curtin with Robert Menzies portrayed as the representative of the old Anglo-Australian grovellers and John Curtin as the leader of a new Australian nationalism. He wrote extensively about Henry Lawson and his impact on the Australian psyche. Love him or hate him, Manning Clark was Australia's greatest historian and unquestionably a literary icon. <laughs>